So my name is Rosemary Wong. I'm a developer advocate for HashiCorp. Uh, today in this room, we're talking about everything as code with Terraform, and this is the DevOps track. All right, two years ago, uh, my first conference I ever spoke at was All Things Open. This is me, two years younger, two, more confused, and like actually way more nervous, right? And at the time, I was not brave enough to do a live demo. Uh, I was terrified, conference internet, et cetera. It's scary. Um, but what I ended up doing was writing a bunch of sample code that was an addendum to my talk. And a lot of people were like, I get your code, but can you just walk us through it? So I created a three-part blog series to walk through this code. So what is infrastructure as code? I'm not going to go too deeply into this. Uh, I, it's an intermediate talk, so we're going to actually go a little bit into the infrastructure piece. I'll show you a little bit. Uh, we're going to Terraform the data center, but then let's talk about extending Terraform. Um, and Terraform is open source. Uh, not to say there, are, uh, there aren't other tools out there, but Terraform is very popular, and a lot of people extend it. And then we'll go into everything as code. Uh, as I mentioned before, I know that sometimes it's hard to see demos from back of the room. So if you go to this shortened URL, you will get access to a live uh, a VS Code live share. It's a read-only collaboration session, but you should be able to see what I'm typing and running off my screen, and you'll be able to see it with the font and the color scheme that you need for your machine. So infrastructure's cold code goals. So uh, the idea behind infrastructure's code, very briefly, is to unify the view of resources. Uh, support the modern data center. So this stretches from infrastructure as a service all the way to software as a service. You expose a way for individuals and teams safely and predictably to make changes. And this is actually really important, right? Infrastructure as code is less about tooling and everything about how do you scale collaboration. Because that's actually more challenging than building a tool in some regards. So infrastructure as code provides this workflow that's technology agnostic. If I want to create something in my target infrastructure, I don't really need to be thinking about the underlying technology. I want to make composites of the resources I need. And I can manage anything with an API. Now that's a, there's a big star to that, right? Not everything has a good API. We'll talk about that. And the problem that I kind of encountered in infrastructure as code when I first started years ago was I don't know how to code. Uh, a lot of infrastructure engineers, networking engineers even, told me, we're like, I don't know how to code. I don't really have time. I'm trying to learn on my own, but I don't know how to apply it back. But I do want to automate how I configure my infrastructure, which is you know, pretty cool. They wanted to try it, right? But then I talked to a bunch of developers. Um, I talked to some really amazing developers who they were like, we don't want to touch the infrastructure. We don't want to touch networking. We don't understand IP addressing. Uh, writing code for infrastructure is really difficult. I can't fathom that, right? Uh, mostly because it's not testable. I can't conform software development practices to infrastructure. Uh, so with these difficulties and ideas, terms, domain terms, and code, Terraform was born, so to speak. So Terraform is based on HashiCorp configuration language. It's an intent-oriented language. That's the way I describe it personally. But the idea is that you don't have to say, you know, I need to learn to code to do it. The idea is that you have the intent, and there's enough specification that aligns with the provider's data model for you to actually decide the configuration you need. So if you're someone who's a developer who's not familiar with infrastructure, you can say, OK, this boot disk is Debian. This is a Debian image. If you're an engineer, infrastructure engineer, you're like, oh, yeah. It's, you know, I can just say, here's a specification. Now, a common question I get is like, is this going to be the same thing across Google, AWS, and Azure? No, it's not. Um, the data model is not common across cloud providers. It's not like network yang model, right, where switches become switches, VLAN, VLAN, common language. There's no such thing. Um, it's going to be wrapped around the cloud provider's API. We'll go into that a little bit later. But the idea is that here you can declare a Google compute resource, and you get the specification you need. And it has some really interesting consequences. The way that Terraform is constructed, it means that it's extensible, right? So you can extend it to different APIs, so you can wrap it around any API you desire, and it's item owned. So you make changes, and if they don't change, it doesn't do anything. But if you make changes, what it will do is it will create resources that need to be created if they're new, it will destroy resources if you want to take them away. 
The resources can be updated in place, and the resources can be destroyed and recreated. So these are all kind of actions within Terraform. But here's something interesting to note. All of these actions are specified by the logic in the provider ecosystem. So the Google provider makes the decision whether or not the resource is destroyed and recreated. It makes the decision whether or not it can be updated in place. This decisioning is built in the provider ecosystem. So there's a whole list of providers here. Sorry about the uh, resolution. But there's a whole list of providers. I think there are about like 200, or no, there's 86 of them now, and then there are 200 more uh, in the community. So people can just write them, right? And companies will write them. Individual contributors will write them. And we post them on the Terraform page. So if you go to terraform.io docs slash providers, you will find a list of them for the infrastructure of your choice. All right, so how do these providers work? All right, get ready. I'm going to talk a little bit about code. <laughs> it's not that bad, I promise. OK, so Terraform, when you download it, comes as a binary. That binary is what is referred to Terraform Core. Terraform Core does a couple of things. It does all those mappings for the configuration language. It does state management. So if you say, I created this infrastructure up there, wherever it is, it will manage that state for you. It will resource graph dependencies. So if you, have graph, if you know graph theory, Terraform works on graph theory. So all the graph theory logic is in the Terraform core. It plans the execution, and it controls the plugin RPC communication. Now here's the trick, though. Terraform core is actually not, uh, hilariously, not that interesting. I mean, it is really interesting, right? It does the mappings. But what's really fascinating about core is the way it communicates with everything else. Because here's the thing. Terraform Core, for those who know gRPC, Terraform Core is the client. It is a gRPC client. And it refers to the plugins or providers, like AWS, Kubernetes, or even 1Password. So the plugins are gRPC servers. That's the trick. And the gRPC servers, these plugins, or these providers, they execute calls for you against the target API. They define the resources, the schemas, the contracts. They authenticate against the target API of your choice. Now, where do these plugins come from? Well, they're independently compiled binaries. These binaries are downloaded when you run Terraform init. So those who have run Terraform, right, you might get the core binary. That is actually just its own packaging. But the sort of like everything else, the logic, the good stuff, the value, comes from the plugins, providers, gRPC server, whatever you want to call it. So when you run Terraform in it, it downloads this set of binaries for you. And they are actually gRPC servers. Uh, and there's a contract with the gRPC client, which is Terraform Core. So this is actually facilitated by something called the plugin SDK. So let's build a provider. Let's actually see what this looks like, all right? So I'm going to go to my machine now. And I see some people, thank goodness. OK. Uh, so here I am right now, except, 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 oh, ex always except anonymous. OK, we're just going to do that. I'm sorry, security. Uh, all right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually show you how I wrote a provider against a sample, uh, a very, very, very simple sample API. I have an expense API. So when I run against it, uh, I actually have API expense. I'm sorry it's in .NET, but it was the only like sample one I had. Uh, oops, expense. So what it will do is actually give me a list of expenses. There are currently none. And so what I want to do is actually create a kind of Terraform resource called expense item. Oops. Expense item lunch, because this will be lunch today. Uh, at all things open, and it will be cost me $10.80. I don't remember how much a Beasley's chicken costs, but you know, something like that. All right, so the idea is I want this resource. This is what I want as a user when I use Terraform. And so how do I implement this? Well, you know, because I came from a, uh, a very uh, interesting background, um, I learned to TDD. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually run a set of acceptance tests that I previously wrote. And these acceptance tests are actually uh, working on a test harness that's built into Terraform plugin SDK. So I have to write the tests, which I'll show here. But the good news is that 
uh, it's already kind of, most of these functions are implemented for me. So if you can see here, there are a lot of these functions that I, I'm implementing, but I'm actually using some interfaces already done for me. And what this will do is it will create, it will delete, it will update, so we'll run all these checks. So when I actually run this, let's see what happens. Because I TDD, I wrote my test beforehand. Oh, failing tests, right? These are red. So first of all, it tells me like, oh yeah, this should be deleted. Okay, that's funny, it didn't delete anything. But on top of that, it also told me that my test resource expense update didn't work, so like it, supposed to update at 200 and it didn't update. So why does this happen? Or like, what did I not implement? Well, let's actually go to the body of code, right? It's always called resource underscore your resource. So you decide you name what you want, but uh, this is usually what you would name it. And as you can see, I've already implemented a create. So that's when I do a Terraform apply, it does that create, right? And the fun part is that it's pretty much just crud or create, read, update, delete commands. So as long as your API does create, read, update, delete, you pretty much can wrap around it, right? So if I look at my create, all I did was say, okay, I'm gonna call my expense client and create the expense with the expense details. Seems pretty simple. Let's see if I can uh, implement an update. Uh, so we'll do this really, really quickly. Uh, and by that, I mean copy paste. I'm really sorry, everybody. Uh, you, we know that's not proper development practice, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that create because my update pretty much works the same way. It's expecting an expense object that I have to pass through. The only difference is that my update also requires an ID because it's updating an existing one. And what you'll see here is this D resource data here. So this is actually the schema resource data that you would declare in the Terraform resource. So remember I showed that lovely Terraform file that said like top name, trip ID, uh, all things open, cost 1080. So all of this schema is being implemented up here. Let me actually just close that down. Yeah, so all this is being implemented up here. So it's just reading the schema. There are various types you can do, uh, and these are all sort of interfaces that you would leverage from the plugin SDK. So here I am. I'm going to create my ID. I have a lovely uh, function called update expense. Uh, it just returns back the error. I don't need to set the ID to nil because it's already been set, and I also don't need to set the ID there. So the idea is all I'm doing is saying, hey, update my expense, and that's pretty much it. What read will do is this resource expense read just issues a get request and just checks the expense. So that's it. So let's see if I did this correctly, because in all likelihood, probably not, but we're going to do it anyway, right, because TDD. All right, okay. So let's do that, and I'm going to make test ACC. Now, for every Terraform plugin you download off of our webpage in Terraform, off the community webpage in Terraform, we actually make everybody write acceptance tests. So that way we don't break functionality. So these acceptance tests are more like integration tests. You do need some kind of like dummy test account so that you can actually run and make sure the resources are being created correctly. So for example, this is actually creating an expense uh, actual expense locally for me. So notice that now it's passed, right? So it did update from 100 to 200, that's what I expected it to do. Um, and delete works very similarly. Basically I would look for my specific delete uh, client function and just do client.delete expense with the ID. And then clear the ID, and that clears it from state. So really like, as long as you have a great API and it has a Golang client in front of the Golang API, you're pretty much good to go. Uh, so if you actually want to implement one yourself, for example, you just need the client, which I've written here for my API expense. Uh, as you can see, it's calling the API, and then you can actually just use that in your provider. Um, and there are a couple of other files you'll need, like a provider.go. This actually declares the resource name, so when I said expense item, uh, that is actually going to be in the provider.go. So I'm not going to run this. It does work. What you'll have to do is compile the plugin. Um, so if I do make plugin, which isn't going to work because it's actually got uh, delete not implemented, but if I make the plugin, the idea is that I can do Terraform apply and plan and destroy, and it will do all of these functions for me. So it executes the update in place. It executes uh, create or recreate, destroy, depending on how I clarify it. 
So that's a quick thing on how you actually do a provider. Cool. I know that's fast. Sorry. OK. So we built a provider. Like I said, you can take a picture of this GitHub repository. It has all these demos in it. So you can actually reference it. Um, and there are also independent repositories. There are some submodules in there because it's easier to kind of condense it. All right. So if you want to build your own provider, a lot of people do. Um, there are some couple uh, useful resources. There is a writing custom providers, which is the official documentation. There's the plugin SDK GitHub, which is now officially separated from core. Previously, it was bundled with core. Probably not a great decision. So we've moved it out of core. It's its own plugin SDK. Um, Eddie, I have to give him a shout out from DigitalOcean. Actually, did a great talk about the testing and, and uh, the Terraform provider uh, for DigitalOcean, which is pretty cool. Um, it's super useful if you're curious about the testing harness and the acceptance tests. And always, you can check out the AWS or GCP providers. Um, those are written by a whole set of developers who think about the patterns and different ways that they can implement um, a provider. So they would have some good examples as well. All right. So back to what I was originally saying, right? This original story. So I started in infrastructure, plugging in switches, et cetera. Uh, started to do a lot of stuff, blogging, et cetera. Wanted to make a blog as code. Um, and so then I said to myself, all right, like, let's actually do this. I learned like, a little bit of the ins and outs of extending Terraform with a provider or a plugin. But like, what happens now? Now I need to make my blog as code, right? Uh, and so lo and behold, <laughs> this is not by any means a love, the, the best provider or most stable provider. It is the Terraform provider for Medium. I did write it. It looks something like this, OK? So it starts with like medium image. Images have to be uploaded separately. So I had to upload that. I had to implement a resource for the medium image. And the post, I had to also write myself. Um, fun fact, the medium provider uh, is uh, only a write and a read provider. There is no update or delete functionality, because the medium client uh, and the medium API does not allow you to delete or update in place. So I have truly immutable blogs. Basically, it creates like this whole set of draft blogs every single time. Uh, so <laughs> there's one downside to that, right? Uh, I found out that the Medium, the Medium API wasn't exactly uh, open to every single command for me personally. Uh, I tried to get access, and it doesn't. And so what happens when you actually have an API that doesn't conform to create, read, update, delete? Um, well, most, a number of APIs under the everything as code kind of calendar bin uh, kind of is a non-ideal upstream API. Sometimes you may only be able to create a read-only provider, so it only reads it in. There's something in Terraform called data sources, so you would have to build some structure to just read things in into a data source. You could also write your own client. Um, a teammate of mine, Mishra, who's originally going to give this talk, uh, he actually had to write a wrapper around some PHP to actually use uh, an API. It was a very complicated, convoluted situation. But he had to write his own Golang client that wrapped around PHP. Uh, and so then that's also an issue. It's also an option. Um, and testing is really important, actually, in this space. You have to express functionality in the form of acceptance tests. Um, it's not just because then it won't be accepted as a provider, but it also tells you if things break, especially when you create, read, update, delete. And also examine interface changes with contract tests. I'll show you something that happened with the Medium provider. Um, so I actually have this as a submodule in here, too. Uh, but if you actually look at the Medium provider on my GitHub, you'll notice uh, that there is uh, a lovely set of things called Read Medium. And I had to implement a client just for reading from the public endpoint. Because fun fact. The Medium API does not actually allow you to read. I have to read it from a public endpoint and then scrape it as JSON. So uh, the best way to explain this is to say I have to go to medium.com and format JSON. Uh, and unfortunately, this uh, schema here, uh, they made some changes to it. So the result was that it broke my provider yesterday. <laughs> so I wish I had the contract test to tell me that they changed the schema. Uh, so something to implement in the future if you decide to do your own. But as you can see here, very similar structure to what I had in my own provider. I basically said resource image, resource post. Um, both of them actually run through acceptance tests to determine how I'm going to create it. There's a post. There's an image. So everything here. And actually, um, when I go through this, Terraform provider medium, um, what you'll see is 
Terraform init. Um, I built my plugin, so the plugin is a local binary. Uh, I moved it into this folder so that I could use it. But when I do a Terraform plan, well, it's going to tell me, hey, you didn't authenticate. You need a medium access token, right? So there are these things that you can actually put in, error handling, et cetera, that you should put in um, to make sure things are good, right? All right, so that repository is up there. I'm coming up on time, but I have one last thing that I wanted to share. Um, if you ever have questions on this, feel free to message me. My contact will be at the end of this. All right, so first of all, you know, this is great. I made blog as code for myself. Basically, now I write things in Markdown uh, when I'm on the plane, and then when I get off the plane, I do a git push, you know, and I can say, like, oh, Terraform plan apply uh, in my pipeline, and then it publishes it to Medium. Uh, now, the thing is that a lot of people kind of wanted to make better workflows for themselves, right? They said, I want to do alerts as code. That's where Datadog, Grafana, PagerDuty also have that, right? You can configure alerts as code. You can to do as code. You know, Seth Fargo, as a toy example, wrote a Google Calendar. Uh, <laughs> Google Calendar, so you could Terraform plan and apply your Google Calendar if you want um, to configure G Suite. There's also one written by a community member. Um, Todoist was also a toy example, to, toy example done. Um, the Meetup provider is something that uh, Mishra, my teammate, wrote. Um, that's the one with the PHP situation. Uh, that's to, coming soon, but the idea was to help better orchestrate. Um, we have a lot of user communities, so and we get tired of having to manually create them every time. So that's why Terraform Plan Apply Community as Code. Uh, there's also a Domino's Pizza one, written as a semi-joke from a Google Cloud provider, uh, Terraform provider developer, but it does work. Uh, so you could get pizza's code. And another teammate of mine, Xander, wrote Pokemon, so you can catch them all as code. However, the Pokemon is read-only, so I warn you, uh, you can't actually catch them all as code. You can only read the names of the Pokemon. So people can get really crazy with this, right? Um, but Let's just think about something that's more practical and something that, to me personally, was more important. So when I started publishing these blogs two years ago, I didn't think they'd get that much traction. I didn't think people cared, really. Um, but then I started getting a lot of comments from around the world to me, saying, I like your blog. It really helped me do something, but I don't speak much English. And can you offer some kind of translation? Is there something available? And it's a hard question to answer, right, because it's like, do I take time to make a translation? And the answer is, well, I would love to. But time, I don't have time. And I don't want to just give it to someone and find a native speaker to figure out how they can translate it for me from scratch. So can I do better? What if I use the Google Translate, uh, Google Cloud Translate API? What if I could do that? And so when I looked into this, I said, well, what if what I could do was write my own provider for Google Translate which, by the way, was actually pretty easy. They have an API that just fires the job. So really all I did was implement a uh, resource text, and all it does is fire the job off to Google Cloud. There's no create, update, or delete, like I pointed out before, because it's just a job. So it creates it every time, but yeah, there's no tracking the job ID. Anyway, that's a long story. Uh, but what if I could actually take my Medium provider and the Google Translate provider I wrote and chain them together? And what I would actually do is really actually blog as code, right? Where I could specify in my Terraform a post that I read from Markdown, publish it to Medium in English, translate it to Spanish from my English Markdown file, publish it in Spanish. And for the Chinese uh, translation, a lot of the Chinese um, readers, they said, we don't really access Medium. We'd like it to be on a different platform because of access, what if I could just publish that elsewhere? I haven't actually determined where elsewhere. But right now it's a markdown file in Chinese. So what if I could do all of this? And the answer is, as you can guess, um, yes. Now, do I know if it's completely correct? Uh, I'm not actually terribly sure. So that's why I'm going to still have a lot of this um, vetted by some friends I know who speak the languages more fluently than I do. Um, but as you can see, created five resources. I have my markdown in Chinese, so I can give this to a Chinese reader. And I also have, if I go to Medium, I also have my drafts here for review in Spanish. So I can have a Spanish friend of mine review it, make sure that things are being translated correctly. 
And so the point of all of this, right, wasn't that I wanted to necessarily personally make my markdown to publish to blog easier. That wasn't all the case. Um, and if you're curious, there's a blog's code demo for the translation. It's also in the same repository. Kept it all in one place for everybody. Um, but it's actually doing better through code, right? So the whole point of DevOps and the whole point of why we're all in here is not about tools. It's not about Terraform as much as I talked about Terraform today. Um, it's about doing better through code, right? It's about saying that I can do better, I can do my work better, but I can also empower someone else to do better through my code and leveraging it. So with that in mind, I challenge you to go out, write your own provider to do better, right? And maybe someone else might find that useful too. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.